The Nine-Sided Circle, for those who would rather be awake than entertained. Well, here we are, and I didn't check to see what the lag time is on everything today, but I imagine it's the usual 10 seconds or so. Um, so, you are not getting this in exactly the real time, but hopefully any moment now you will be hearing the dulcet sounds of my voice as they come through the interwebs to your computer or phone or tablet or whatever you're listening to. So... Here we are. We have a few people uh, showing up, and tonight's uh, topic is going to be the Yoga Sutras of Pat Patanjali, which is something that uh, I really enjoy uh, listening to, talking about. Uh, good, and I am being heard and seen. That's very exciting. So, I hope this finds you all well, and while we are waiting for the rest of the crew to show up, uh, where's Michael? Uh, any questions from last week? Last week was, a, for me at least, a fun week, and hopefully you guys had a good time too. This week could be even funner. Of course, I'm drinking coffee at 7 o'clock at night, so I could be talking very, very fast any moment now. And if I am, sorry, I will try and slow down. So, the Yoga Sutras. They were written about 2,000 years ago. There is some argument on exactly when they were written, perhaps a uh, hundred years before the common era, perhaps 200 years after, or somewhere in that slot. Um, they are fairly old though. They, Buddhism predates them. And I have a sense that uh, Patanjali probably got some of his model from the Buddhists. Uh, I also kind of doubt that Patanjali was a man, but that goes into uh, another story, which we won't get into. Um, I have a feeling that uh, he was actually a woman yogi who was writing as a man because back in those days, women didn't get enough respect. But anyway, uh, be that as it may. Uh, it's interesting because uh, at the time that Patanjali wrote this book, there was no real differentiation between kinds of yoga like we have today. You know, today you have bhakti yoga and kriya yoga and all of these different yogas, uh, karma yoga and all of this kind of stuff. And, oh yeah, and, and Hatha Yoga. By the way, it's not pronounced Hatha. There is no TH sound in Sanskrit. It's Hatha. You pronounce each letter separately. Um, and what we understand now as yoga is not the yoga that was practiced in classical times. Not even close. Um, probably 95% of all yoga practiced in the 21st century in the West comes from one individual. Uh, his name was Krishna Macharya, and he taught Iyengar and Patabi Joyce and pretty much everybody else who was teaching yoga in the late 18th, early, or late 19th, early 20th century. He died in, uh, 1985, I think it was. I have it in my notes here. I actually have notes. I made notes for you guys. Uh, yeah, he died in 89. So that's how recent modern yoga is. And it was based out of uh, a, a, some yoga texts and, and some teaching. But uh, Krishnamacharya came to the fore when yoga was in, in basically in disrepute. One of the translation of the term yoga that you find in modern Sanskrit dictionaries is charlatanism. Uh, 
just so as you know. And that comes from that point. But we will talk more about that uh, later. Uh, so, Krishnamacharya was very much into the postures and poses and physical exercises of yoga, and that has affected uh, everything uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. That's not what Patanjali said yoga was. If you look at his opening lines in the Samadhi Pada, and that is uh, the first book. Pada literally means foot, but uh, it also means a book or a chapter. The first chapter of the Yoga Sutras is called the Samadhi Pada. And it starts out saying, Now, here's the teachings of yoga. <clears throat> yoga is the stilling of the twistings and turnings of the conditioned mind. At that time, when the, when the twistings and turnings of the conditioned mind are still, the seer sits in its rightful place as witness to the universe. At all other times, the seer is identified with the objects of sight or identified with the universe. This is a rough translation just off the top of my head. I can, I can dig out the, the book and read it to you, but that's how Patanjali describes yoga. And he goes on to give a methodology by which one accomplishes this thing. And it's broken up into four books. Uh, the first book is, is the Samadhi Pada. Samadhi is an interesting word, and we're going to get into that because it's one of the eight limbs. Second book is the Satnapada, and that is, uh, Satna means practice or doing. So that's kind of what we're looking at uh, in the second book. And uh, the third book is the uh, Vibhuti Pada, which is uh, the book all about the supposed powers that a yogi gets. It's not really about that. It's more about the states that you pass through, but that's a different story. And the fourth book is the Kaivalya Pada, which is the book of liberation. Uh, what um, the results of the practice, what you can be looking forward to. It's a great book. And I highly recommend it to anybody who uh, is watching uh, this video. By the way, my screen is locked up uh, in looking at uh, what's going on. Is Are people hearing me and seeing me move around, moving around, moving around here? Uh, just to make sure that it's just on my side and not on your side. I'm not going to worry about it too much uh, unless people start complaining. Okay, good. Laura! Good. This is important. So, <sighs> Alas, I just got a note from Dr. Bill, who is uh, at the emergency room saving lives so he can't join us tonight. Uh, hopefully he will have a quiet night there. Uh, that's what you hope for when you're in his business is absolute and utter boredom for eight or ten hours, whatever your shift is. Uh, So where was I? Oh yes, we were talking about yoga and the doing of yoga. So, 
to give a, a brief synopsis, uh, Patanjali goes on to explain that the that there are klishas, there are that kind of impurities, the the crap that gets in your way, and uh, they all stem, according to him, from ignorance. And uh, his process of yoga removes the ignorance. That's what he's he's looking for. So that's what you have going for you. Um, and the part that I wanted to talk about starts on verse 29 of the Sadhanapada. And that's the description of what yoga is. There's actually two descriptions in the book. If you go to the beginning of the Sadhanapada, it talks about the Kriya yoga. Kriya means the doing of yoga, the action of yoga. And that is a slightly different description than the, the uh, model of yoga that he presents. And the model of yoga that he presents, pulling out the book, I don't know if you guys found this book. Uh, as you can see, mine is a little worn. I consider this uh, Chip Hartrempf's uh, translation put out by Shambhala Classics. I consider this to be the best translation into English that I've seen. Uh, there will be a better one. There always is. Uh, but right now, this is, I think, the best one that you can go for. And while I have a, a few technical points that I would disagree with him on, all in all, he did a superb job of this translation. So, before I get into this, let's talk for a moment about yoga. The word itself. Now... One of the terrible things that the West has done is that they have not exactly mistranslated, but misemphasized this word and attached some things to it that should not be attached to it, in my humble opinion. Um, they, everybody says, yoga means union. Union means union with the divine, union with God, union with Krishna, union with Brahma, whatever. Uh, and yeah, yoga means union, but that's not the way that Patanjali used it in his text. Um, the word yoga, the root of it means to yoke, to join to attaching, harnessing something, like harnessing horses to a cart or chariot. Uh, it also, when you take an arrow and you fix it to uh, the string, that's yoga. Uh, and it also means an expedient or a method. By the way, I'm reading off of my notes here. I spent yesterday and today going through and checking all of my translations of every problematic word that I'm going to talk about to make sure I have them exactly right, you know, comparing between four different dictionaries that I have and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, so if I'm looking like I'm not looking at you, I am in fact looking at you, but I'm looking at you through my notes that are up on the screen. Um, so a better translation for yoga than uh, the standard union would be integration. It's literally taking the broken parts of a person and rejoining them, hooking them back together to create a homogenous whole. It is taking the, sh the, the shattered eye and gluing it back together. Because as it stands, when the uh, the seer is identified with the objects of seeing, uh, the seer is fragmented by each of those objects. And when you withdraw attention from the objects of seeing and disidentify with them, you create a a, a whole a whole on again, and that is. 
the actual meaning of what Patanjali was talking about. Other people might disagree with me on that. They're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, Hatha. By the way, I, like I said, it's pronounced Hatha. Hatha, not Hatha. There is no TH in Sanskrit. So, Hatha Yoga means violent yoga, literally. The word means violence or force. It also means oppression. When you're talking about somebody being hatha, they're oppressing you. And um, that's something, the main text of hatha yoga didn't come around until about the 15th century. So the Yoga Sutras predated by five to six to seven hundred years, depending on who you want to listen to. So, also, as I mentioned just briefly uh, last week, the Yoga Sutras are not a religious text at all. They don't talk about God. They don't talk about the gods. They don't talk about Krishna or Brahma or any of that, that sort of thing. There is one word that modern translators translate as God that appears a couple of times in the Yoga Sutras, and that is Ishvara. Ishvara is an interesting word because it can mean Lord, and you, you find it in conjunction with the names of, of like Shiva. Shivashvara or Shiva Yogeshvara, Shiva the Lord of Yoga, you would translate that. But that's a later translation. You can do you can do Master, Lord, Prince, King, Mistress, Queen, because it is non uh it's non gender, it's a, a neutral gender. Uh and you could also say the Supreme Soul, the Atman, especially in its uh, non-personal sense, but the the root translation of the word means able to do, able to do. And my sense is that Patanjali used this word to describe not some god, but the quality of a person who has been reunified through the process of yoga. Uh, and can actually do rather than react. He understood, and he talks about this, that most people uh, are merely stimulus response meat ma machines working from their conditioning. Uh, uh, the word he uses in the text is samskara, the subliminal memory traces that create our responses to reality. Uh, so what is usually translated as God literally means able to do. So figure it out. So without further ado, because this is going to take a little while, and I think that we will be able to get through this this evening. I may run a little bit over. If you can't stay around, if I run over the eight o'clock mark, this is all being recorded and the recording will go up after uh, we're done. So you can come back and watch it later, though I hope that as many of you as can will hang out with me. Yes, Ian, exactly. Power to initiate action. Power to actually choose an action rather than uh, act from uh, your conditioned responses. So, the eight units, according to this, the eight components of yoga the eight things that make up the practice of yoga are external discipline, which is yama, internal discipline, niyama, posture, which is uh, asana, breath regulation, which is prana, pranayama, 
concentration, meditative absorption, and what he calls integration, which are uh, pratyahara, uh, or, yeah, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, uh, Dehrana, let me pull up my text. Dehrana, yeah, one second. I have all of my Sanskrit up on the screen. Uh, okay. Yama. Uh, that's the, the discipline of the internal. Niyama, which is the discipline of the external. Asana, which is the, uh, the sitting of your body. Uh, pranayama, which is your breath. Dharana, which is concentration of thoughts and, uh, emotions. Um, Pratyahara, which is uh, the withdrawal of the senses. Dhyana, which is usually translated as meditation. And Samadhi, which um, is often translated as ecstasy or, or any of that kind of stuff, but does not mean any of that. So... Yeah, there's actually a typo in the book because he leaves out pratyahara, which is the withdrawal of the senses in, uh, at least in the section that I'm reading. So, sorry, Chip, you have an error here. That was what was throwing me off. I couldn't find that. So, the eight limbs. We're going to talk about each of these. The uh, yamas are uh, five disciplines. Uh, the first is ahimsa, which means, uh, they say nonviolence. Ahimsa doesn't really mean nonviolence. Uh, it means not harming. To be harmless, to be... Uh, without uh without malice and that people think of ahimsa as the monk who sits there while people beat on him and doesn't do anything this is not ahimsa because that is uh, a violent act uh, harmlessness is the best Explained, I, I think I quoted this to you at some point, by my first Tai Chi teacher who said, I do not fight. I merely do my meditations in such a way that a clumsy attacker will fall down and hurt himself. That is real ahimsa. There is no anger, no wish to harm within the person, but there is a movement to create harmony when necessary. And... Uh, That is a, a very useful thing. The second is sasatya. Sasatya comes from the root satya, which means the true, the real, the actual, the genuine. It's very much like the Arabic word haq. Uh, it means honest, sincere. Um, sasatya is a state of not just not tell they they usually say not lying uh, but that's a terrible translation it means rather to be uh brutally honest with yourself about reality not telling 
the truth to everybody all the time. There's a there's a great story about that by this yogi yogi about a yogi who always told the truth. And uh, some people ran by; they were being chased by uh, bandits who were going to kill them and rob them. And they said, "Don't tell the bandits that we came by this way." And of course, the bandits came by this way, and they asked the yogi, and the yogi thought. I should never lie. So he tells them which way the people ran. So a few years later, the yogi dies and he ends up in hell. And, uh, you know, he says, why am I here in hell? And Yama, the god of death, says, well, you remember when you didn't lie and you told those bandits where those people went? Well, bandits caught up with them. They killed them. So you're in hell because you didn't lie. You should have lied. It would have been better. So that's not the kind, that's not the satya that is being referred to here. This is the um, and, uh, Miyamoto Musashi said it best. Do not think dishonestly. In your own views of yourself, remove all of the illusions and all of the lies that you tell yourself about yourself in the world. That's real satya. The next one, uh, asteya. It, it literally means not stealing. And that's it. That always struck me as weird. It's like, what? Yogis were prone to, to be thieves? But again, you got to look a little bit deep, deeper. Astia, when you see A in front of the Sanskrit words, it, the word is usually a negation. So, stia means theft, robbery, or larceny. Or it, it can also refer to anything stolen or liable to be stolen, or anything clandestine or private. So, not stealing, astia, in this case, does not mean don't steal. It means do not be hidden from specifically yourself. And it goes back to satya. Uh, do, not, do not steal away parts of your ego and keep them hidden away uh, like a thief in the night. Now, the next one, everybody freaks out over the next one. The next one is brahmacharya. And it's usually translated as celibacy. And people look at that and they go, oh, so I can't really practice yoga unless I'm celibate? But I like this person over here and I would really like to jump into bed with them from time to time. I mean, you know, we're married or whatever. The thing is, Brahmacharya does not mean celibacy. It's a compound word. It's made up uh, from the word Brahma, which Brahma is the one self-existent spirit. You know, they say Brahma and Atma are one. You know, Brahma is being, is, is being in its totality. Charya is an interesting word because it means practicing, performing, uh, to, to be engaged in something. So, brahmacharya literally means being engaged in or engaged with the one self-existent being or consciousness. And in this case, because it does refer to something sexual, it says, do not have objects of sexual desire. The key word there is object. If you are, say, a horny 16-year-old, and I'm just going to speak bluntly, so if, if you guys are easily shocked, plug your ears, because I am not going to hold back just because somebody might be made uncomfortable. It's my job to make you uncomfortable. It's in my job description. Make people uncomfortable. So, your basic horny 16-year-old, especially a basic, basic horny 16-year-old male, I can speak from that because I was one and I remember what it, what it was like. 
does not see the object of his desire as a being, as an inwardness. He sees the object of his desire as uh, a method to fulfill his urge. This is not brahmacharya. When a human being matures, they experience the other as subject rather than object, and they experience the other as uh, Brahma, as the universal being looking back at them. So, sex for a yogi should be, uh, if they are practicing correctly, um, a method by which they experience uh, the universal being within another person in a very intimate energetic relationship. Uh, and so if you can do that, you're, you're on the path of the yogi. You're actually brahmacharya, whether you are sleeping with somebody or not. So bear that in mind. Quick, quick check. Does that make sense to everybody? Nick, that is one of the oldest of the sex ed lessons, and it's one that keeps getting forgotten. Good. So the last of the five is parigraha. And, uh, now, excuse me, I forgot... Uh, It's aparigraha, which is usually means renunciation. And that's the, the last of the five. Uh, means non-acceptance, uh, you know, to be an ascetic. Uh, parigraha, remember, if you see an A in front of the word, it's usually a negation, uh, means laying hold of on all sides, surrounding and closing, fencing round. Um, and what Aparigraha is telling you is not to be an ascetic and only own one robe in a begging bowl. It means do not surround objects of your desire with your consciousness. Do not uh, be trapped within the identification with wanting a thing. And we've all done that. At least I'm assuming that we've all done that. I know I, I maybe have done this once or twice. Uh, you know, you see behind me the objects of my desire show me a really good sword and there's a part of me that still to this very day just covets it if only for a few minutes wishes it were mine would like to walk off with it Kyle is doing a really really good job of writing out what I'm saying Uh, which is, at least by me, greatly appreciated because I know that I'm talking fast and because we are not sitting in the same room, it's hard for me to to catch signals if you're not getting it. So this is a, a good thing. So the first limb of yoga has to do with being in the world and how to be in the world. And that is the five things that I just mentioned. That's yamas. Niyama, which comes from the same word as yama, uh, is the internal parts. And there are five of those. The first of which is called shaucha. Shaucha means purity, purification, purity of mind. It also means integrity and honesty. But most important, it means the evacuation of excrement. In other words, a yogi goes out and takes a shaucha. 
And of course, the excrement that we are talking about here is not necessarily the physical bodily excrement, though I will tell you that in Ay Ayurvedic medicine, they are very, very much into that part of it. They want to clean out your digestive tract as much as possible. But my sense is that the cleanliness here is not just cleanliness of person, not just internal physical cleanliness or external cleanliness, though each of those is very, very important. Uh, I remember to, to switch from yogis to Sufis for a second, that there's a story of when Bahawadi Nakshband, who was the founder of the Nakshbandi order, was in training. Uh, a plague was uh, going around uh, Bukhara at the time, and he was sent out by his teacher to clean the streets. And his charge was to remove all filth from the streets while at the same time remaining scrupulously clean himself. And that is uh, another sense of saucha. So, the first of the internal uh, steps is uh, cleanliness, cleaning up your thoughts. And y'all know that most of your thoughts, uh, the mechanical thoughts, are the same thoughts every day, one way or another. And most of them are what we would consider excrement. And it's your job to remove that excrement from the window of the viewer, of the seer. And even when you do that, you will still have the subliminal stuff. But the first step is to remove the liminal. And that means to train yourself to be in a state of what we now call mindfulness, uh, for lack of a better term, while uh, you go throughout your day so that you are not just uh, excreting the same words over and over and over again. So, yes, remove the stories. The next uh, internal work is santosha, which means contentment or satisfaction. It also has the sense of gratitude. Um, part of what creates misery is thinking about things that you don't have that you wish you had, or things that you have that you wish you didn't have, and that keeps you out of the moment, because you can only think about that in terms of past or future. So to uh, contentment is the true happiness. The other word uh, that you can translate as contentment or satisfaction is ananda, which is usually translated as bliss. It's another one of these things that uh, in the West we have... Uh, deceived ourselves. One of the classic yogic sayings is Sat Chit Ananda. Sat is being, Chit is mind or awareness, and Ananda is usually translated as bliss. But it is not that. It is nowhere near that. The sense of Ananda is much more the sense of being absolutely perfectly content and happy exactly where you are. And that is considerably more rarefied than bliss. Anybody can have some bliss. You can go out and, and, and snort some nitrous oxide and you'll be blissed out for a while. You know, do a little MDMA uh, and you'll be blissed out. This is not either Santoha or Ananda.
Yes. That that is a good point, Michael. Thank you. And Nick also has a very good point there. It is it with everything you are a caretaker. So the next one is called tapas. Tapas means heat. And this is one that uh, people have a hard time understanding. Tapas is the friction caused by the work. When you do the work, you are rubbing up against your excrement. And since the excrement, by the time you get around to doing the work, is usually hard and dry, it creates friction. And that friction tends to burn away uh, the, the stuff that you want to get rid of. So tapas, I mean, there, there's various ways to describe it. Uh, there's a, a ceremony where, where you expose yourself to the heat of five fires. Uh, you can do austerities, you can do bodily mortification and call it tapas, but it's not that. It's not penance. Um, it is the heat and energy generated by the work. When you start breaking this stuff up, you begin to release energy. And that energy can be used for the work, or it can be blown off. And this means when you get that energy released, when the movement creates friction, which creates heat, which is perceived as energy, use that. The last of the five of the niyamas is svadhyaya. It means literally self-study or your own reading. And usually it's, it means uh, in modern translations to study the Vedas, to study the holy books. Um, but what you should be studying is yourself, the study of self, to, to actually um, do the self-observation. And we've talked about self-observation before, and we will talk about it again. So, that is the second uh, of the um, spokes of the wheel of yoga. The third is called asana. Now, asana just means sitting. It means sitting down. Uh, and Patanjali says, Oh yes, and this is one of the places where you find that, that word mentioned in... Uh, Verse 43, right after uh, self-study. Uh, Chip translates it as, self-study deepens communion with one's personal deity. I would translate it more as, self-study brings you to the place of actually being able to do. And... He goes through then saying, through orientation towards the ideal of pure awareness, one can achieve integration. And pure awareness is another way of translating that Ishvara word. Then he talks, he gives you asana in uh, just a few lines. He, he says here, and this is worth listening to, the postures of meditation should embody steadiness and ease. This occurs as all effort relaxes and uh, coalescence arises, revealing that the body and the infinite universe are indivisible. Get that part again. 
revealing that the body and the in infinite universe are indivisible. Then one no longer is no longer disturbed by the play of opposites. With effort relaxing, the flow of inhalations and exhalations can be brought to a standstill. So it goes right into the idea of first you chill out. You learn to let your body uh, sit in a state of uh, equilibrium. And that's what I usually think of when I think of asana, is bringing yourself to a state of equilibrium in the physical. And it is important to realize that, as the, the book says, your body and the infinite universe are not disconnected from each other. They are one field. And they, that one field, or it, it's one pole of the field. The other pole of the field is being. So you have matter, the universe, and being as the two poles of the field. So, these three spokes are the, the external being in the world. The fourth spoke, pranayama, is the uh, interface between the external and the internal. And he says here, With effort relaxing, the flow of inhalation and exhalation can be brought to a standstill. This is called breath re regulation. That is not a great translation of it. Let me pull up the Sanskrit here. Um, we're looking at 49. It means that there is inhaling, exhaling, and pause. Gati. Uh, and that's incredibly important. He's, he's delineating that there are three parts to the breath. The letting the, he actually starts with letting the air out. Then pause it. Then letting the air in. And pause it and letting the air out. And between Patanjali and various other uh, texts, the, the, the Shiva Sutras, for instance, make a big deal on that pause. Uh, you want to pay a lot of attention to it. And specifically the pause at the end of the exhale, that is where uh, the money lies, as it were. So, there is a particular kind of pranayama 
which is usually referred to as the original pranayama, which is derived directly from uh, the Yoga Sutras and the Shiva Sutras. Uh, and uh, is very different than most of the pranayamas out there. There's no breathing in through one nostril and out the other and doing any of this this other kind of weird stuff. Uh, and yet I can assure you that it is incredibly powerful. Easy to learn, incredibly difficult to master at first. Um, and nag me and I will teach you all how to do it. Because it ain't that hard when it comes down to it. It merely requires constant vigilance on the breath. So, the fifth limb of yoga, pratyahara. This, it usually is translated as withdrawal of the senses. And let's see what Chip has to say here. Yes, uh, he mentions here in uh, verse 50, as the movement patterns of each breath, inhalation, exhalation, pause, or lull, he calls it, are observed as to duration, number, and area of focus, breath becomes spacious and subtle. As realization draws, the distinctions between breathing in and breathing out fall away. Then, the veil lifts from the mind's luminosity, and the mind is now fit for concentration. He makes an important point here, Patanjali does. There is the pranayama that you actually do consciously. Beyond that, there is a pranayama that happens um, naturally within the movements. Uh, I learned this even doing Surya Namaskara, the, uh, the sun salutation, where uh, we were instructed, do not breathe while you do this sal salutation. Allow the movement to breathe you as you move through it. And I encountered this again and again and again um, one of my Tai Chi teachers basically said the same thing. He said, if you're doing the form correctly, you never have to breathe. The movements of the form breathe you. This is a, a reoccurring theme. Uh, and so I, I wanted to mention that before we leave Pranayama and get to Pratyahara. Okay. When consciousness interiorizes by uncoupling from external objects, the senses do likewise. This is called withdrawal of the senses. So the word pratyahara, drawing back. The, idea, the, the image is drawing back troops in a battle, a retreat. Uh, withdrawing from the created things or withdrawing from the things that are given to consciousness. This is where you go from self-observation to self-remembering. Because rather than uh, observing that which is given to consciousness, you go from the referential to re the reflexive and observe consciousness away from the given things. So you turn the witness on itself. And uh, another meaning of this word is reabsorption or dissolution of the world. So, the process of breaking away from the phenomenal world is called withdrawal of the senses. And... Uh, it's not so easy because we like the senses to be connected to the things of the world. It could be said that it is unnatural to withdraw the senses. And in, the, in, in a, a real sense it is, but um, the non-intuitive is often where you find the truth. What can I say? 
So the next limb, um, the next limb is Dharana. And this is uh, an act of focusing. Uh, it says here in the book, uh, Oh, and we, we are now going from chapter 2 to chapter 3. For some reason, uh, Patanjali split the last three uh, from the rest of the limbs and put them in the chapter called Extraordinary Powers. And uh, it makes sense after a while. So, Tehrana is the concentration of the mind uh, and what that means is to become one-pointed uh, to end up in zanshin in remaining mind to make sure that you are not distracted by that which is given to the senses to experience in the world um, there's a great example of this. Uh, yourself, the observer, there is no yourself, the body. This is uh, Alex's question. The body is an object given to the witness uh, to observe. Yes, you need it. Uh, you cannot be the witness in this reality without the body. It's, like I said, it's a field phenomena. But when I say uh, yourself, I am speaking of the observer. So, one-pointedness of focus. Uh, they took a bunch of Zen monks and a bunch of normal people and they put them, uh, they, they hooked up electrodes to their heads and hooked those up to EEG so they could monitor their brainwaves while they either sat around or meditated. Yeah. And they noticed something very interesting. They had the, the group of non-meditators in a room sitting, being quiet, and every now and again they would make a noise. And what would happen is the first time they made the noise, they got a big jump on the EEG. The mind went to it. And every uh, subsequent time, the jump happened less and less until the people ignored the noise completely. Now, with the Zen guys, it was totally different. They made the noise. They got a little jump. They made the noise again. They got a little jump again. They made the noise again. They got the same little jump. The jump never changed. They could make the noise a hundred times, and the Zen guys in their state of meditation would not habituate to the noise. It was as if it were a new noise every time, and it was just enough to notice and then let go. That is the kind of focus that we're talking about here. So the next limb is called dhyana. Dhyana, uh, if you take that word to China, it turns into chan. If you take that word to Japan, it turns into zen. And dhyana is usually translated as meditation, though that is, uh, I think, a lousy translation of the word. Meditation comes from the Latin, and it's the same root as medicine. It means healing up, and this is not that. Uh, Patanjali says, he calls it meditative absorption, Chip does. Uh, the entire purpose perceptual flow is aligned with the object. So, concentration is a first step to this. 
then the object the subject object relationship tends to disappear in uh, Tiana, which is why you get that thing of uh, the blip never changing when uh, a disturbance happens. It is noticed, cataloged, and released. Yeah, it, it's interesting because one of the definitions of Diana is the, the mental representation of a person of the personal attributes of a deity. And that goes way off from what Patanjali talks about. Uh, more Sean, more like uh, as in object becomes subject, as if there is no difference between subject and object. But being as consciousness is intentional, it's always going outward. Uh, in meditative absorption, the entire perceptual flow is aligned with the object. Then, when only the essential nature of the object shines forth, as if formless, integration has arisen. Now, Here's another word, samadhi. Uh, it means putting together, joining, combining with union, a whole, an aggregate, a set, a completion, an accomplishment, a conclusion. Now, in the West, when I, when I was a young lad coming up, People talked about samadhi as the reward that you got. It was it was not a practice. It was this it was this thing that was usually thought of as a state of enlightenment. Oh, he's in a state of samadhi. Samadhi is not a state. It's a practice, and I can demonstrate that it is a practice just by the next lines in the sutras. And because we have disconnected ourselves from that knowledge. Um, lots and lots of Westerners and some Easterners have been conned by this. Chip translates uh, Samadhi as integration. I don't. I disagree with this translation, not because it is in inaccurate to the word, but because it is inaccurate to the state. Uh, for me, the best translation of samadhi is flow. In the, in the sense of the flow state that one gets into uh, when doing certain things that require uh, a massive amount of concentration. If you think about, let's say you're a wingsuit flyer. You need to have one pointed awareness you need to be able to let the object and yourself be completely connected in your experience. So uh, you are not looking at the terrain as you are flying through canyons in your wingsuit as things that are out there and you're here. You are connected to them. And when that happens, you enter into a flow state. And that flow state is a practice. You, one practices being in that flow state. And the flow state is what allows you to safely navigate uh, narrow canyons in a wingsuit. You all know what a wingsuit is, right? If not, uh, go to YouTube and look up wingsuit flying and watch a video of somebody sailing in a little flying squirrel suit uh, through all manner of things. So, samadhi is the cultivation of the flow state. And it is very important uh, that you realize this if you actually want to do what Patanjali describes in the Yoga Sutras. If you think that it's something that you get as a reward for meditating, uh, you'll never get there.
So, Patanjali goes on to say, Concentration, absorption, and integration regarding a single object compose the perfect discipline of consciousness. This is uh, an interesting way of translating it. The word that, that Patanjali uses that he's translating as perfect discipline is samyama. Um, pulling up Where is the actual Sanskrit? Excuse me. And we're almost done getting through the section I wanted to get through, so I'm not going to be too far behind. So, <laughs> yeah, the, the entire long English sentences are composed of three words in Sanskrit. Treyam ekatra samyamaha. Treyam means three. Uh, Three, uh, the three ones, these three things that are together, compose the samyama, the great binding. This is the actual practice that you want to achieve. The eight limbs are designed to get you to this one thing. And the one thing is the samyama. Somebody likes that. Uh, where my notes go? So, samyama means binding together to take these three sections and combine them into one practice. Uh, So according to my erstwhile strong right arm, she has lost me for the moment. I'm waiting for her to get back on. Uh, hopefully everybody else is on and the things have not been too terribly difficult. Uh, So one of the things that they talk about as, as the meaning of samyama is the destruction of the world uh, in the sense of the world being broken up into uh, its component parts. When you step away from the veil, when you look underneath the skirts of maya, uh, the world is destroyed. Uh, in the uh, in the Spanda Karika, they talk about uh, Shakti exhaling and absorbing reality into her internal self and then inhaling and creating the world again from that inhale. That's like the first lines. Okay, good. So, that is a description of doing yoga. And hopefully, uh, it made some kind of sense to you. And if you are wondering...
why I decided to go through that. And for, here you are, if you are uh, anything like me, you would be asking yourself, why is this person who is, is a follower of, of the Sufi path talking from this Hindu book? And I, I have mentioned this before, and I will explain it to you again, uh, just because it bears saying, the Yoga Sutras are not a book of religion. They are a book of science. They are a form of phenomenology. They take you through a process that is scientific in nature. It doesn't matter what you believe. If you do what it says, you will get the results that it promises. And you can believe anything that you want. Or nothing at all, which is even better. And uh, this will get into uh, next week's talk a little bit. One of the things that I have noticed is that I don't know if it's true for everybody, but for most of the people on the path, especially the teachers I have known, each of them has had a book. My teacher um, had uh, a book called Sir al-Asrar, which means The Secret of the Secret. Uh, it was written by Abdul Qadir Jilani uh, back in the 10th century. And that book irritated my teacher in the best possible way, in the same way that a grain of sand irritates uh, an oyster to produce a pearl. He studied it. He's still studying it. He has a copy of it that is literally held together by rubber bands. It has been read so much. And he's been reading it for 50 years. Uh, in the book, just won't let him go. It says, pay attention to me. I'm telling you something. And it becomes one of the tools for a person's awakening. For me, the Yoga Sutras were that book. Uh, I read them for the first time when I was probably 13 years old. And they have um, been nagging me ever since. They, the Yoga Sutras were the reason that I learned Sanskrit because uh, I came to realize from looking at the uh, exitant uh, translations that they were all so different. It had to be because nobody knew what the hell they were talking about. So that was all about, oh, I want to learn how to read this in the original. That means I have to learn a language. The only place I can learn that language is in India. Let's go to India. And the rest, as they say, is history. Um, and it turned out to be true because no translation of the Yoga Sutras do it justice. Chip's translation is by far the best, comes closest to what the Sanskrit actually says. Uh, but... And I'm, I'm sure he would agree that it is merely a representation of the original text, not an accurate uh, translation of it. So, the Yoga Sutras are one of those books that can get under your skin and irritate you to the point where you produce the, the, the pearl. And that's why I wanted to go through it tonight, because it, to me, it gives you such a clear exposition of what the path actually is, uh, what the work is, that uh, I don't know of anything that to me is as clear, though for other people it might be different. So that's what I had to say on stuff tonight. I hope that you found it interesting, educational, and if nothing else, slightly entertaining. Um, any questions? I see lots of hearts coming up. I can't complain about that. So questions. I will tell you. The next week, I intend to talk about a subject that I call 
Finding Your Way by Finding Your Way. And that last way was with the capital W. And I, uh, it's something I, I like to do long walks. So today I did a long walk uh, along the river and through the oldest part of the city and basically gave me a chance to engage my mind in a certain way. Sean Bryan, any relationship with Dune? Everything has a relationship with Dune. Dune was a book that was prophetic in nature in its own weird way. I'm not sure how Herbert wrote the book the way he did. I suspect there, there was some sneaky inspiration going on there. If you haven't read Dune, you should. If you have, you should read it again. Uh, there are profound truths in it, in its own way. And it's fun and entertaining. Somebody is going to miss next week. Well, here's the good news. You don't actually have to miss next week because you can come back at any time and watch the video. Yes, Ross, a kind of walking meditation. Um, as I've mentioned before, walking is an extremely important practice in the method that I learned. Uh, the, the, we aren't called nomads for no reason at all. We are nomads because uh, our nature is to move. All right, well, then I guess I will uh, thank you all for being with me this evening, taking an hour or so out of your... Uh, the comments should be all in the replay, yes. And you can, at any time write any question in the comments, because I do check. Uh, I make a point of uh, going and looking uh, from time to time to see if anybody has asked anything interesting that needs to be answered. So, hopefully you've had fun, and it's... God, we, we ran a little bit over, 20 minutes over. That's not too bad. Uh, Yes, the comments are not synchronized, but they will all be below the video. So thank you all very much for your time and your attention. Um, I'm actually really getting to enjoy these talks, so I'm looking forward to next week. And until then, um, peace and blessings and all of that kind of good stuff wave at you, and we will talk to you next time.